Hello, adventurers, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ken, or Roper, depending on which you want to call me. Um, I'm going to go through a very comprehensive guide of how to set up Foundry and run it uh, from 0 to 100, basically. Uh, I want to go through all the steps from the very beginning of how to download it, how to start your first world, what systems to use, and so forth. Um, and I will be uh, going through the whole thing on kind of a collection of modules that are pretty good and what that means and, and how to use them and implement them in your own game. Um, I've been running Foundry for just over a year now. Uh, I've put a lot of time into it um, and I thought that maybe I would have some useful techniques or tips or something to show to show people. Uh, so let's go through some steps together and take a look. So initially, the first thing you need to do is to download it. Um, once you've purchased Foundry, if it, if you go to this page and you can't access anything or do anything, uh, at the bottom here, uh, where it says, I accept or don't accept, if you accept first, then you're able to browse Foundry and access their privacy policy. Uh, to download it, you simply click on your name up here in the top corner, uh, purchase licenses. I'm going to blur my license out for, for obvious reasons. Uh, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux Node are all here. You select that, and I would recommend the, the latest recommended or stable release. They're both pretty good. Um, and then uh, basically where it says uh, download, you just download that. If you're doing a Linux Node or if you're running this on a Pi, you can use your timed URL instead to, to get it. Uh, once you have that downloaded and installed, uh, we'll move on to the next part here, which is basically... I just have to pause the video for a second there. Something I noticed that I didn't mention that I should have. Um, when you uh, are setting up Foundry for the first time, it's going to ask you to put in a license key. Uh, you pop in the license key from the website that I blurred out that key. Don't give that to anybody. That is your official license. They can download Foundry using that license and stuff too. Uh, that's your official key. Uh, you paid for it. Um, that key, when it asks you for your license key, that's exactly what it needs. So just put that information, just copy and paste it into Foundry, put it in, and then you'll be on the screen that I show you here. The configuration and setup. Um, what we have here is, uh, your, this is where your game world will go. Uh, we'll come back to this in a moment. I just want to go over some other things first. Maybe there's some settings or something you want to change before you actually get into your world. Then we'll jump in and we'll, we'll move on from there. Now, Game systems. This is the game system that you plan on using. Now, for mine, I'll be using D&D 5e, but they do have fantastic ones like Pathfinder and stuff. Uh, Teamman has made like a fantastic Pathfinder um, system. What we'll be using is D&D 5e, um, or at least what I'll be using. Atropos has put in a lot of work on this. Effectively, what it is, is like it runs the game rules for you, how the dice are interacted with, how the environment loads and how uh, everything is just built around the core rule structures uh, and system of D&D 5e. Uh, so you click install on that and it should start downloading in a second. It doesn't take too long usually. Um, once you have your uh, system set up, uh, Atropos does a lot of updates. Uh, I don't know so much about the other systems. I know you can do things like Warhammer on this as well, which is great. Um, but you... I know for Atropos, he does like a lot of updates and stuff, which is fantastic. This controls things like how resting interacts with your character sheet and stuff like that, which is just amazing. Um, once you have this set up, uh, you can lock this little lock here just means you can lock it so it doesn't update or you can click on update to check for update. Or if you choose to uninstall it or even install another system, you can. You can install as many as you want and just select the one you want for your game. So you can host, if you like to play a ton of tabletop games, you can have a, a lot of them, which is great. Um... Modules. Uh, modules are a little bit more advanced and I will go into it in more detail, but effectively what a module is, is uh, it's like running an advanced mod on your system that allows you to change mod, yeah, uh, allows you to change your um, different fundamental things for anything from visual effects like automated animations, which works way th uh, great with JB2A animations. I'll talk about that later. Uh, even better roofs and stuff like that. So if people have seen... Uh, an idea that they had in Foundry that isn't in the core Foundry system. There is a currently 1,196 assets or mods that you can download to change that. Uh, everything from how lighting interacts with your character to even to languages, which is fantastic, uh, or different type of content packs. There are premium ones as well. Like the uh, if you play, uh, like for example, I've got Toma Beasts here. Um, I play. D&D &D 5e, but I also have like Cobalt Press, Toma Beast 1 and 2 and stuff. 
Uh, you can download and install this after Plus set it up with uh, the, the people at Cobalt uh, Press. You go to their website, you can buy the module and then link it to your account. Uh, that's a little more advanced. I'll talk about that later, but I, I will show this off more in detail, but effectively that's what modules are. Uh, configuration, your administrator password. This is the password to access your um, admin side. This is something you don't want your players to have necessarily, unless you trust them, uh, but we can get into that a little bit later too. Um, the port in which uh, you use to to host Foundry, most people just use 30,000. Um, you can set that up with UPnP, which means that it's easily discoverable. Uh, what that effectively means is when I open the Foundry program, it automatically opens up port 30,000. And when I send out my link to my players, they can connect through port 30,000 and it allows it to work. I'll show you. It sounds more confusing than it is. I'll show you in a moment how that works. Uh, default world, if you've got a lot of worlds, uh, but you want a default, you just click here and you'll have like a list of your populated worlds. We don't have one yet, uh, but this is how uh, this is how it works. Um, your path is where it'll store your like your assets, your world, your uh, the systems that you use like this that we just got. That's the folder on your computer that it's being stored in. Uh, default language English, but you can download more. Optimize static files, you don't need to worry about it. And SSL certificates, unless you're hosting or something, you don't need to worry about that. And even if you were, you wouldn't change that here. You would change that in your config file. So um, update system. Uh, every so often, you'll get a little exclamation point on a settings cog in your game that says, hey, it's time to update. Uh, when you have that, you can update to the latest uh, alpha, beta, or stable release. Um, you can click check for updates. It won't have one at the moment, but you can do that and it'll, it'll work ahead. What I will say is version... In Foundry, when you're downloading versions, uh, if you are, let's say, 0 0.7 through 0 0.79 or 0 0.8 to point, uh, through 0 0.89, uh, that allows you to, to update no problem. But when you're updating uh, like a, a later release, so if you go from 8.9 to 9, I strongly advise waiting. Uh, don't do that update right away, as exciting as it sounds, because all of the modules that you download and use are optimized for 0 0.8 not 0 0.9. Um, what I've noticed is that when I jumped up from to 0 0.7, a lot of my modules stopped working for a long time or altogether if they weren't supported anymore. Uh, a lot of my modules then again from 7 to 8, they just, <laughs> that was really difficult. Um, so it, it's a big problem. Uh, a lot of the people on the subreddit for Foundry VTT, uh, they will put together lists of uh, supported mods when they're updated and everything. And once your list of modules is updated, off you go. Um, I use something like, 80 modules I use a lot um, but yeah so it's it takes some time but just make sure that when you're updating from like if you're update from 0 0.1 to 0 0.81 to 0 0.82 not a big deal uh, but if you're jumping from 0 0.89 to 0 0.9 which should be at any day now um, then it becomes more of a just a buyer's beware a little bit of caution type of thing things will change things may break um, also when you update your uh, system at D&D 5e for example it updates a system in-game called Compendium. So I'm going to show you all of that too. But just keep in mind that doing these updates can take a little bit of time. Um, okay, so let's talk about creating our world, getting into that, and then go from there. So you can install worlds. These are pre-built worlds that people have, uh, that people have uploaded from different adventures or different, like mostly patrons and stuff like that would do this. Um, they basically upload the full world and it has like assets, characters, tokens, that kind of thing. It's it's usually pretty good. If you're trying to run a preset campaign, this is a pretty good way of doing it. Uh, hopefully we'll see this more in line with uh, official kind of uh, sort of content, which would be nice. Like if you could download uh, the Storm King or, or any of these and then just have all the assets, have everything ready to go. That would be amazing. But baby steps, we're getting there. Uh, okay, so click on create world. So we want to call our world. I'm going to call mine test. You can call yours whatever you want. Um, test. Um, so the path, this data path is where data, worlds, and what your world file name is. So what that'll be stored as. So for example, uh, I can call my world overall. I can call it uh, Azeroth, okay? But I can still leave the data path as test, meaning that if I go to my, my C drive, to Foundry, data, or whatever, go to data, world, data folder, worlds folder, and then the test folder, all of my files for the for the Azeroth world are in the test folder. Does that make sense? So this, whatever this is, is the name of the folder on your computer. Uh, let's just call it Azeroth, sure. Uh, game systems. Uh, at this point, you should have installed your game system like I showed you a few moments ago. 
In this case, we'll be using D&D 5e, but you can use different versions, of course. Uh, background image. You don't need to worry about it for now, but where this anvil is in the back with the, with the Foundry logo, uh, you can change this. Uh, you can set your background image to whatever you want. I usually use a map of the world that I made on Incarnate, um, but it's uh, you can you can change it to whatever you want. Uh, if you want to put a session date in, right now it's November 23rd. Uh, if you want to put a session date in, you can. So, like, I don't know, November 28th, but... Oops, that, um, at 1800. And then when your players go onto the server, they'll see when the next session begins. Um, world description. Uh, I stole this from my app. There you go. Um, you can format things and do things, which is pretty cool. Uh, all of your text blocks have uh, have the ability to do this, and you can even get um, modules that actually interact with e even just text and, and stuff like that. So we can, I'll talk about that a little later. There's some really good ones. Um, but yeah, you just create the world. There you go. I stole this from WoW. That looks awful over there, but yeah. Uh, it tells you what core version you're using, which is, again, which is this. Uh, it tells you what system you're using, which is this tab here. And then it tells you what your path is. So in mine, it's just my computer, my local uh, folder, and then my worlds, and then world Azeroth. Uh, once you have that done, you click launch world. Now, uh, this is from my main campaign. So I have changed some of the core assets, uh, the KJV thing as well. I've changed some of the core assets of the uh, the actual game itself. Uh, I'm going to show how to do this so you can change this for your campaign, but it does change it for every campaign. So uh, you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, select user. Um, in this case, it's just Game Master. And as far as I know, there is no password as a default. So you click Join Game Session. Uh, in the bottom left, so down here, you have your Game Master files. This is uh, all of your players will be listed here. Um, the screen should be gray. Uh, you should have your toolbar here on the side, um, your macro bar at the bottom and your chat box at the right. So what we're going to do first is let's set up our, our players and our users. That's what I'm going to do in this one. And then we will go from there into uh, more complex things like bring characters and worlds and tokens and all of that. Um, so my name, like I said, is Roper. So I'm going to pop that in here. Uh, password. Here's the thing. Uh, passwords, they save in plain text uh, on your computer. If you don't know what that means, that basically means that there's a file on your computer. You can open that. Anyone can open that and you can see the passwords. So uh, be very cautious about using passwords here. Um, you can just leave it empty and have no password if you want to. But of course, that's probably not safe either. Uh, but it's just that if you're hosting something online, like Foundry is hosted online, people can access that information, see the passwords, don't use a password that you particularly love and adore if you use, I wouldn't advise using the same password on every website anyway, but if you do, you know, don't use one of those. But, uh, so just set it to whatever you want. And then, uh, the role is, uh, game master, assistant GM, trusted player and player. Uh, how this works is, this is probably the best example right here. So if you click configure permissions, um, you get a nice window here, which explains what, uh, game master is assistant GM, trusted player, and an actual player. Uh, so the, the game master is would be myself, or would be probably you if you're setting up Foundry. Uh, you're going to be running the game, so you're going to be the, the game master itself. Assistant GM is someone who maybe helps out the game master. I usually say dungeon master, so if I say DM a lot, sorry. Um, but it, the assistant GM is somebody who maybe helps the GM but doesn't have access to absolutely every tool. So maybe I don't want them to all broadcast audio or video, which you can do in Foundry. It's fine. Uh, I use Discord, but you know, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, but so configuring token settings, for example, uh, it's not a bad thing to let your players be able to do that. If you use something like Polymorph, for example, uh, there's a really cool feature in, in Foundry where if you drag a, a token of, say, uh, I don't know, a bat, uh, drag a bat onto your character, onto your wizard or whatever, It'll turn the wizard into the bat, and then you click Restore Transformation, and it changes them back. To do that, they need to have these configure token settings set up, which is pretty cool. Creating journal entries, I always promote this because I really want my players to have journals. I want them to take notes. I want them to be paying attention and listening. Um, now, it doesn't always happen that way, but at least giving them the access to do that is a good thing. Creating map notes. This is... So if you have, uh, let's say, a map open... Uh, which, you, which you can do. You can set up maps and all sorts of windows. I'll show you all of that, which is great. Uh, you can create pins on the map, um, which then have information like they're connected to a journal. Uh, what I usually do is I've I've created 
a, a vast world and in all of that world has all of these different notes um and each of the notes if they double click on the pin it will open up and expand and that journal then has a bunch of information like this is the town this is kind of stuff you've learned about this town or whatever i usually encourage them to update those notes not myself but that's <laughs> that's different um to create map notes you could just say trusted players this is the gm um the difference between say a player and a trusted player realistically is a regular player is maybe maybe you have a lot maybe you play publicly with a lot of people you bring people in all the time and and it, that's that's amazing if you do uh but if you're doing that uh you don't want to always have to give them access to absolutely every tool you don't know what they're going to do or if they're going to mess around they are just a player a trusted player is more people that you've probably played with for a long time friends that you know people that you give your trust to assistant gm again is somebody who maybe helps you control scenes and do things Honestly, I gave, uh, because I have a host foundry on my Raspberry Pi, uh, I gave the Raspberry Pi section uh, assistant GM access because it just gives me quick access to both sides, which is pretty cool. Um, create map notes, like I said, yeah. So create measure templates, you want to give that to your player. Basically, a measure template is, let's say your wizard casts Fireball. Uh, it'll put down a template automatically and show you this the circumference of Fireball. Uh, and when it does, it uh, it auto calculates whoever's inside there says, oh, these people need to roll a dexterity check and you can get modules that make that really, really interesting. Uh, but you definitely want your players to be able to do this. Create new actors. I leave that for GM and assistant GM because that is the ability to create a whole new character. Now you not manage the character now, create a character. Uh, so create an NPC, create a token. You can do that and let your players have that too, but things... Uh, the more that you have in Foundry, the slower it gets for people to load in. Uh, I'll show you ways around that in another tutorial, but it is uh, it is pretty good to keep a tether on that. Um, same with creating new items and new tokens. I don't want my players to be able to create new items because uh, I don't really allow too much homebrew. I, I, I'm usually rules as intended uh, myself. So when it comes to that, I just want to use the items that are in the book. I don't want them to create stuff and do stuff. I, I have generally a, a very, very extensive compendium that just copies everything over as, as it needs to and I'll show you all of that stuff too. Um, creating tokens, same thing. Um, do they want to create tokens for the actors that they can own on a canvas? So do they want to create like a, let's say the, I'll use the wizard again, it has a familiar, uh, the wizard summons their owl, do they want to be able to create that? Generally I actually say yes to allow them to because they can uh, allow that to pull them onto the scene and then play it. So that's fine. Uh, display mass cursor, I always turn that off because I don't want to see if I play in a big party, I've got seven players. Uh, I'm the DM for seven players. Um, I don't want to see seven uh, mice running around my screen, um, effectively. Display ruler measurements. I usually have that on. Um, it just allows me to see if they're trying to measure something or figure things out. You can turn that off. Uh, it just means, can you see other people's rulers? Not your own, but other people's when they're measuring and stuff. I usually leave that on because often I find my players trying to explain, oh, it's about 20 feet from here. I want to do this or... You know, it comes up. So modify configuration settings. I don't even let my assistant GM do that. That is to change modules to disable different core features of the game and the config that I showed you a minute ago. That is that part. Open and close doors. Absolutely. Uh, you can lock a door and then a player can't open that. They can't unlock the door without your permission. Uh, so absolutely, they're fine to open and close doors. That's okay. Upload new files uh, using file browser. I don't usually do that, but that is just if, uh, if you... You can add things to to sheets like uh, pictures and different things. And if you want them to be able to upload a file, which then downloads to that folder that I showed you a little while ago on your computer, the one that says like, uh, for me was slash test, I think, or did I, I maybe I changed it to Azeroth. Um, that's where they will go. Um, use drawing tools. <laughs> Trusted players for me, not so much normal players because I don't want uh, things to get too inappropriate. Um, it's bad enough having a bard on the team, you know. Um, so when it comes to this, uh, it means, can they just draw all over the screen that they're on? Um, everybody sees the drawing. It, it's, it gets a bit out of hand sometimes. File browser means, can they, uh, view the files on your system? I do not do that. Um, but I, I'm, I don't like the idea of them like browsing through assets and accidentally stumbling across a spoiler. Maybe I downloaded a picture of a BBG. I want them to fight and then they come across it and that's a problem. Using script macros, absolutely I allow this because a macro often usually makes things easier and I don't make them, like you can share macros with people. So if you don't want them to use it, you just don't share it with them and they don't see it. So it doesn't matter. CRISPR private messages, absolutely. 
Um, you can turn it on or off that the GM can see it or not uh, using modules and stuff like that. And I'll go over that in another tutorial. But yeah, like whispering is, is a normal part of D&D. It's like just, just let people have whisper. Um, if you don't want them to whisper, if you don't want them to talk behind your back, that's fine. But they're going to do it anyway in WhatsApp or Discord. Or if they're sitting at a table, they'll just talk to each other when during a busy moment. So it doesn't matter. Um, when you have this ready, you just save the configuration. Uh, creating an additional user. So let's say that I want uh, Timmy to play, um, but I want him to be a player. So we've got Timmy the player here. Uh, password can just be whatever. I set the password. Um, they don't really set up their own passwords, but like I said, you don't really want them to anyway. It's plain text. So for their security and yours, just a generic password. What I usually do is just let them pick between like a, a name of importance to them in the game or something like that. Um, it gets a bit more complicated when you start playing publicly online with a lot of people. So maybe you have a system or something like that. Or if you use like Android or Apple or whatever, you can use the, the key gen uh, tool to just make a generated one and just send them that and they can use that to access it. That's fine. Um, so we have Timmy here who can now play in the game as a player. But say I want a sub GM, um, uh, like let's say Laura, the sub GM. Um, they want to play as well. What they get is they get my assistant GM logo. That's fine. They can play. And let's say we have somebody who, uh, say Sylvie, um, is playing and she is a trusted player. I've played with her a long time. No problem. Right now we have our, our GM, a player, an assistant GM, because things get crazy when you have two players for some reason. Uh, Sylvie with the trusted player as well. Uh, so you click save and return when you have that. You don't need to set them up this way. You set it up whatever way you want. I'm just kind of showing off what each one does. Now we come back to our logo. Uh, Ego Aguilaros is this is the campaign I'm running at the moment. Don't worry about that. Um, so I have uh, so I have Roper, which is me. I have Laura, Sylvie, and Timmy. Now, if I'm coming on, I go to Roper and I type in my my own password. If it's say Laura or Sylvie or Timmy, they'll click on their own name, type in their own password, and in they go. If you want to go back to the full settings for the campaign, you go down here and you type in the password and you click return to setup. Uh, if it didn't have a password, you just click return to setup. Um, but I recommend highly that you do put a password in for these things. But uh, as I'm Roper, I'm going to do that. We'll go back into the session and I will end the video there. Uh, as we go into the next one, I will explain how to set up maps and tokens and all of that lovely stuff, and we can go from there. Perfect. Uh, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it.